It's Friday, it's four o'clock, and you're watching Truthloader Investigates Live. Coming up today, music from the planet... MP3s in your DNA. The way we did it, you can store uh, about two petabytes of information in one gram of DNA. And could we clone a Neanderthal? It's more than theoretically possible to take a piece of DNA from a that's, that's so degraded in a museum piece and put it into a cell and have that cell take on new properties. Hello, welcome to Truth Loader Investigates Live. We've Hello. Already, we've already said that it's Friday, <laughs> it's four o'clock, so it's time for us to be live. It is time for us to be live and Spongy Frog, one of our favorites. If you're watching, you'll notice that you emailed us about Neanderthals and we are going to talk about them later amongst some fascinating other things. Yes. We've got mini quadcopters, we've got music from Planet, which we'll be going on to in just a moment, and storing stuff, like computer stuff, like from Reddit and Ting, in your DNA. Amazing. Keep ah. your comments coming in because as ever we have our laptop and we can read out comments that make sense. <laughs> we uh, can. If they don't make sense, we'll probably not be reading them. And we can try and read out the usernames that don't, which we'll be leaving up to Phil. <laughs> which is every <laughs> username on YouTube. absolutely unable to tell a 4 from an A, so if you've got a username with a 4 in it, then uh, please comment, from, comment, make it nice and readable for us. Anyway, should we kick off? Let's kick off, because first off, and this is a bit of a historical one, did you know that NASA have recorded music from planets. The actual planets in our solar system have been used to make music. And what you're going to hear now, these are actual recordings of the songs of the Earth and Jupiter as recorded by NASA. Mental. Mental. Planet. It sounds exactly how I anticipate space would sound <laughs> in yeah. my head. That's what if you're going to have a sound for a planet, make it sound like Jupiter does in, <laughs> in real life. Yeah. Uh, the Earth's amazing though, isn't it? It, it is. It's just a kind of a sequoia chirping kind of thing. How bizarre. Yeah, weird. But anyway, how did NASA record these sounds? Well, in the case of Jupiter, it was Voyager 2 that did the dirty deed and made the recording. As Assistant Professor of Physics John Millis from Anderson University explains. Voyager 2 spacecraft made a pass through the outer part of the solar system going past Jupiter and Saturn and Uranus and it was taking measurements of radio waves, light uh, and um, particles that were streaming by the planets. Charged particles from the Sun and uh, from other sources out in the universe can get trapped by the magnetic fields of these planets. And when that happens, the charged particles are accelerated around the, uh, around the field lines, and when that happens, they also produce radio waves. And what NASA did was effectively take that information, those signals, if you will, and assigned them sounds. It sounds sort of peculiar, but you, we have devices that do this all the time. I mean, the radio in your car, right, takes a light signal, a radio wave from a radio station and converts that into sound. And what they're doing is they're sort of compressing all of that information into the very narrow bands that we can that we can hear. So, please answer this question for me if you may, or if you can. I will. Could you point a big radio satellite receiver doodah into space and record the noise of space? If you pointed your doodah into space... Yeah. <laughs> You don't try this at home, children and people. <laughs> if you pointed your antenna skywards <laughs> and, and listened very carefully, uh, no. Oh! <laughs> Unfortunately. Well, you could. You could hear some of that. The problem is that this, the planets are vast, and radio waves are a vast, vast spectrum. So your usual radio, your usual antenna, could only pick up a tiny, tiny fraction of what you're hearing there. So what NASA have had to do is they've had to take all of the data that they've managed to collect and cram it all together into something that our puny, rubbish little ears can understand. Yeah. So you would get something if you pointed it skywards, but probably 
probably not that much. But if you're pointing it at Russia, you'd probably <laughs> get a pretty strange noise. Yes, you would. <laughs> yes, you would. We did a report on number stations a couple of weeks ago, is what Phil is referring to. You'll find a link somewhere in the bottom at some point when we put it in there. There are spy stations in the USSR. Yeah, Other amazing. strange noises do exist. They do. They do. From all good retailers. And in fact, talking about all good <laughs> retailers, you could buy a recording of all of these sounds. NASA actually released an album called Symphony of the Planets, mm. which you could buy. They released it in 1992, and uh, unfortunately it's discontinued now. But if you go online, it is available free, courtesy of the US government. So we'll try and put a link in the description to that as well. So if you want to go and hear more of this stuff, it is, uh, well, it's actually, it's really beautiful chill-out music, isn't it? It is. It's... I love it. I think it's the kind of thing that you should grab, mm. put into a uh, music creation piece of software, which I, I shall not name, and do something creative and amazing with it. I really think there's a lot of potential Absolutely. to make something good with it. And uh, it is the biggest musical instrument that has ever been played. Yeah, we were thinking <laughs> about doing a piece about this, remember? We just an extended mm. music, truth loader, art piece. So let us know <laughs> if you want us to do that, because I'm kind of interested in that idea. Yeah, because there's all kinds of weird and wonderful instruments out there, things like the, uh, the Tenori On. Uh, Google that if you've not seen one before, but it's a bizarre musical instrument, so I thought we could do something kind of going out and exploring the uh, the really strange side of music and musical instruments. Let us know if you'd like me to do that, and I'll try and get that sorted for you for next week. Mm, truth Loading Investigates Music. Music. Anyway, talking about music, these planets aren't just... Well, the music of these planets, sorry, isn't just uh, cool listening. There's actually some real scientific data behind the recordings as well. This is why the Voyager probes were making these observations in the first place. Um, one of the things that we would like to understand, for instance, is things like auroras. Um, we have auroras here on Earth. We have the northern lights, as they're called, the aurora borealis. And then, of course, we have the southern lights as well. And uh, we see that same type of phenomenon on other planets. Uh, Jupiter, for instance. I mean, this is an active area of research. Shrimpay6000 says he's interested in us making that music thing. So let's well, do that. that's one that's one nil in favour of the music thing. And look at you, you managed to read out a username with numbers in it without fluffing it up. <laughs> hey, six thousand easy for me. <laughs> that's actually goo. It's no throw me off. <laughs> Shrimpy goo. Right. Anyway, moving on. DNA. DNA. And we're still on the subject of music a little bit here because did you know that you can now store MP3s in DNA? That is proper proper science, isn't it? There's basically a lab in Cambridge who took a strand of DNA and encoded it with a speech, uh, with Martin Luther King's speech, the I Have a Dream speech, and a photo of their office and a text document. They actually did this, they managed to encode it into DNA, the same stuff that we're made of, and then decode it again, and it's just absolutely insane that you can do that. It is, it's pretty mental. That is mad science. And uh, earlier this week, I spoke to Nick Goldman from the European Institute of Bioinformatics, looking at my notes there professionally. I've learned this before I say it. <laughs> a nice little sheet of paper. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> anyway, he spoke to us earlier in the week and described the advantages of this, the biggest of which is the absolutely mind-bending storage capacity of DNA. The way we did it, you can store uh, about two petabytes of information in one gram of DNA. Uh, and a petabyte is um, a billion gigabytes, tapes and discs and so on. They, they don't have a good lifetime. They, they last a few years, but the, the medium itself, a disc or a, a, a tape, uh, gradually degrades over time. Uh, and the machines break down and need replacing. You know, in 10 years' time, when that technology has moved on, will we have a machine that can read the 10-year-old disc? It's a bit like, you know... Betamax was quite a good idea at the time, maybe, but if you've got some important stuff stored on Betamax tapes now, it's essentially useless. DNA doesn't have that problem. It, it, will all, it survives without needing any complicated uh, conditions. It survives thousands of years, uh, and we will always be able to read it back as long as there's technologically advanced people doing science. Two petabytes per mm -hmm. gram. That is mental. A USB stick weighs about 20 grams. So if they figured this stuff out, like in the future, where you can just plug this thing inside of a computer, that's 40 petabytes on a USB drive, which is, let me try and figure this out. <laughs> that's 40 billion gigabytes, or to go down one again, that's 40 billion million megabytes. Now, 
Yes. It's something like <laughs> a lot. It's a lot. Anyway, <laughs> you could store an awful lot of pictures of kittens, or if you liked pornography, on such a device. Yeah, um, mental. But I, I also think on the DNA thing, that if it blows my mind to think that we have that inside of us. Mm. Lots of it, not just one gram. I mean, like, we have it in every single cell in our body. Absolutely, yeah. And so the potential, and isn't there something in DNA called, what scientists have called junk DNA, which is this part of the DNA strand where they just say, oh, it doesn't mean anything. But maybe it does mean something. Maybe there's this data well. inside us being carried around with us. I find that idea mind-bending. Probably not MP3 is being carried around that junk DNA, though. Um, no, but it say. could be something interesting, <laughs> couldn't it? What if it's like it a book? Be. Um, a book. <laughs> Brilliant. Winnie the Pooh. Um, anyway, unfortunately, on that, on the junk DNA, there was some research done recently, and what they thought was junk DNA, stuff that we don't actually use, most of it is actually still Something. used. It's just kind of been turned off because it's functions that we don't use so much anymore in our, in our modern lifestyle. But I think they decided that something like 85% was usable DNA that was actually being used. But anyway, what, they, what they're doing with this, it's not human DNA that they use. It's a completely fabricated <laughs> system. But they put it together. It's not the fastest encoding system in the world. This yet. One, the, yeah. yet. The yeah. one megabyte they did, I think, took 36 hours to create and about two weeks to read again. So it's not, uh, not the fastest hard drive in the world. Mm. But of course, the media have leapt on this. Oh, you're putting things into DNA. What if someone puts a virus into DNA? What if someone create some kind of biological weapon using this system. But it consists that there is absolutely no danger whatsoever and it doesn't pose any threat to anyone's health. It's completely different code. We don't want to put information into living things. We have no desire to do it. It would be a really bad idea because living things evolve. You don't want your archived information to evolve. You want it to stay exactly the same. A bit of DNA of the kind we made has no meaning. The code we've used to store information is completely different. It's no more dangerous than saying you could be dangerous to eat a CD. So, Beyblade King 2012, painting, but out, <laughs> said, so could we be stored for years and then be taken out? Basically, yeah. I mean, the stuff that, the reason why they're doing this and the, and the main advantage of this system is that uh, DNA will literally last for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. We're going to be talking in a moment about uh, Neanderthals, mm. kind of cloning Neanderthals. Mm. And there is usable DNA in 30, 40,000 year old corpses. So this stuff will last absolutely forever. And it's just a tiny little smear. And yeah, it's absolutely incredible. So here's my plan. Before I die, I'm going to remove some DNA. I'm going to cryogenetically freeze it. And then in a thousand years time, when they figure out everything, they're going to bring me back to life. But will yep. I be me? Well, you will be you, biologically, but obviously you wouldn't have any of your memories, I guess. Yeah, but the, yeah. well, we're going to come to this. Towards the end of the show, the Raelians had a few uh -huh. views on this, those, those crazy folk. But we'll leave that till we, <laughs> till we get to it. If you've never heard of the Raelians, by the way, they're a French-Canadian cult who uh, tried to do something fairly unethical. <laughs> Just stay <laughs> tuned and we'll tell you what that was. Yeah. Anyway. What's our next story? The next story is Neanderthals. We mentioned that a moment ago. Yeah. And you might have seen in the paper over the last couple of weeks, there was a story out which basically claimed that uh, Professor George Church from mm. Harvard Medical School, the most about, just about, respected man in genetics who was uh, responsible in part for decoding the human genome, apparently came out and said in an interview in Germany that he was looking for a brave woman to surrogate a Neanderthal clone and that they were going to basically bring this species back from extinction. Uh, Neanderthals were our closest relative. They died out about 25,000 years ago. We lived alongside each other for a quarter of a million years, so there was quite a big overlap there. Anyway, it turns out that unfortunately it was just a mistranslation in a German magazine. He didn't say that. He's not planning on cloning in Neanderthals. So if you've seen it, unfortunately, it's not true. What do you mean, unfortunately, it's not true? <laughs> you mean, fortunately, it's not true? Well, I, I don't know. <laughs> They're not going to rule the world suddenly, are they? I think one Neanderthal is probably quite interesting to look at. don't imagine he'd hold much of a conversation, though. <laughs> anyway, this is George Church of Harvard Medical School, and he's told us that the press should have known better than to jump on the story. Everybody's fib detector should have been going off. They should have been saying, what? Who would believe this? If it were on April Fools, they would have, nobody, hopefully, nobody would have, you know, maybe we don't have to accept global warming as a truth in the 1850s, 
but we should be able to detect that nobody is actually working on cloning Neanderthals in, in 2013, right? Well, why not? <laughs> because you I'm, changed your tune. <laughs> I know. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm undecided on this mm. because, yes, there are some profoundly massive ethical questions, but I, I'm, I'm kind of interested. You know that we can, but should we, debate <laughs> that continues. We can do it, but well, should we? Should, well, should this we is the thing, yeah. I mean, you know, maybe the technology is there, maybe the technology is not quite there yet. Should we do it? Well, actually, in all honesty, what would really be wrong mm. with cloning in the Neanderthal? He might get funny looks at school. What would we get but, from it, though? I what mean, would we get from it? Yeah. Get Neanderthals back. <laughs> Far from that. Maybe we should do something better like um, <laughs> saber tooth tigers or no, they're dodos. Dangerous, aren't they? Do well, they're rubbish. There's not a lot. Woolly. Mammoths. Mammoths. Woolly mammoths. Yeah, everybody be up for that. I'd be totally down for mammoths. I would definitely be up for a mammoth. And you could breed micro mammoths. So they'd be like micro pigs and you could have your own little pet elephant. But why really uh, furry. It, it's fascinating that we can even do this. It just blows my mind that, that, that we could. So, <laughs> so because we could, we should. Well. Maybe. I, I think it might not give it a go, frankly. <laughs> I'm up for anything, but then I'm not the poor Neanderthal baby or the mother that's got to give birth to it. No. Uh, anyway, there's many ethical considerations, but could they do it? Uh, here are the experts' opinions, including George's. In a lot of cases, we can isolate DNA from uh, fossils, and uh, these fossils have to be fairly young, though. And in the case of Neanderthals, we have young fossils, 30,000 to 40,000 years old. And indeed, DNA exists in these fossils and can be isolated from the bones. It's more than theoretically possible to take a piece of DNA from a, that's, that's so degraded in a museum piece and put it into a cell and have that cell take on new properties due to what was old information but is essentially newly synthesized DNA. That could be extended to almost any extinct species that's recent enough that, we've got, that we can get DNA from it. Makaya Yasharal, sorry if I said that incorrectly, has got a great comment. He said, why clone Neanderthals when they are walking around every day now? <laughs> there he is. Uh, Perfect. <laughs> on, the, on that issue, though, about them being able to do it, mm. I had this thought. It was, it's one of these filled thoughts. Go on, a dangerous pastime. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So let's say, like, an asteroid hit Earth. Right. And in the asteroid was DNA from an alien uh, planet. Mm -hmm. Could they clone a fossilized DNA or whatever? Yeah. Could they clone an alien from that? Well, that is the question, isn't it? I mean, they have to be fairly new fossils. That's the thing. You've got to be able to extract it because there's not much DNA just left in, in rock fossils, mm. which is one of the main reasons why the whole Jurassic Park thing sounds like it would be a brilliant idea. That's still a little way off because the DNA is just so badly degraded. And we don't really want, we do don't want dinosaurs. We definitely do want dinosaurs. <laughs> I'm sorry, there is no debate about this. <laughs> We definitely do want dinosaurs. Well, there is a debate. Let us know what you think in a comment. Personally, I want a triceratops. Yeah, let's just bring the herbivores back. We can leave the raptors to be scary elsewhere. No, but we've got to have the raptors because then what would eat the herbivores when they started eating our gardens like common pests that yeah. they are and clearly were? I'm beginning to think we should. I'm aspects. already promoting a triceratops cull. <laughs> I think there's far too many of them around already. But the Raelians are well on top of this, aren't they? Yes, this French-Canadian cult. Very, very strange people. Yeah, to say the least. Um, you know a little bit about them. I, I know a very little bit about them. The Raelians appeared, the first time I saw them was around about 2002 on a talk show, and some guy came on and was like, oh, we're from the Raelian sect. We believe that aliens genetically engineered humans to be on Earth. Um, which, by the sounds of the science here, isn't entirely well, if implausible. You've, if you've but, seen Prometheus. Yeah. So he, that's, that's what they believe. <clears throat> but then he said, we have cloned a human baby. Mm. And this was in 2002. Mm. They set up a website called Clone Aid. Some uh, lady started saying that we're going to clone this baby. We had doctors on board and it was going to happen. But it did, it, it did it happen? Clone Aid is a much cooler version of Gatorade. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I would definitely drink that. Uh, and then there would be five of me in the morning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, there was a question. What? <laughs> the question is, did they actually clone a baby? No. No, they didn't. The company who uh, the Raelians supposedly controlled came out and said, no, this hasn't happened. Mm. And to be honest, it's, it was only nine years ago, but 2003 to 2012 is light years in genetic medicine and cloning and all of this stuff. You've got to remember that it's only like 
20 odd years ago now since we had Dolly the sheep and we've now moved on to the extent that the world leader in genetics as you've just seen is claiming that we could basically take any animal that died out within the last 30 or 40,000 years and make another one. So we've really moved on. Mm. Uh, but at the time, certainly there was no way that you could clone a baby. Here's an idea. Baby. Could we clone Tutankhamun or someone like that? Yes. That's an interesting idea, isn't it? We could get Caesar's if, DNA or I'd, I'd Jesus' yes. DNA? I mean, surely the Christians would be interested in this. Potentially, yeah. Interesting idea. I mean, I, I say yes. I'm not <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. I don't have a cloning experiment going on in my basement at the moment. I'm not a alien. I don't have a baby. But, cloned or otherwise. No. Um, but let us know what you think. Should we clone Jesus? Will the second coming of Christ be some sort of genetic uh, experiment? <laughs> we are getting into murky waters. It's sci-fi now, isn't it? We've gone totally sci-fi, but that's what this show's about. G Jesus sci-fi. Now, there's a whole new <laughs> subgenre. <laughs> There'll be a subreddit on that in the morning. Anyway. <laughs> yeah, and if there isn't one, guys, you should totally set that up. Definitely. It, Link us, we'll join it. Yeah, yeah, I'm there. So, have we got any more clips? We do, but first off, let's talk about a little bit about what's coming up later this week and um, maybe talk about what people have been saying to us. If we've got any interesting comments, has anyone pronounceable said anything pronounceable? Um, maybe we could put the Neanderthals on an island and see how they would have evolved differently from us. That's spongy frog. As a, as a test. That's an interesting idea. You know what we could do? We could put the Neanderthals on an island where we've also bred some kind of you know, modern day dinosaurs, you know, in a theme park type setting. Pedro Kurlos has <laughs> said exactly that. He says you'd need a landmass the size of North America Pedro. to resurrect a Jurassic ecosystem. But, you know, thinking about that, we could just use Australia. That's an, <laughs> I, that's I think an the island. Australians might have something to say about they would, that. They would. But it's the <laughs> ideal place to do it if we were. So let's not get it. I like Australia. It's true. Yeah. So that, that's the rest. That, we have a my comments, baby. Really. No, no more comments? No. Well, what have we got coming up later in the week? Uh, well, it's the end of the week, so next week... <laughs> Later in the week, we've got the pub then, <laughs> and beer, and next celebration. Next week, we have uh, games. We're doing uh, two debates ah, about games. Yes, a gaming getting... special. Yeah, it's going to be awesome. We've got YouTubers coming in, uh, art critics, we've got people working on that, and it's going to be amazing. Monday is our comment piece at 4pm. Tuesday, we're going to have a debate at 4pm about gaming, though the title is just being crafted and carefully considered at the moment. Can we, can we hint at what it might be? It's about sexism in games ah girl gamers yes excellent so tune in for that particularly if you are a girl and you are a gamer yeah and on thursday we're looking at something along the lines whether, of oh. whether or not games are art and whether or not games cause violence we're still trying to craft the title for that but that's that's the route we're going down that's thursday at 7 p.m we're going to get some big gamer bloggers in and it's going to be amazing so tune in for that absolutely so if that's the kind of stuff that does interest you if you're into your games then do tune in it's four o'clock on the tuesday and it's seven o'clock on the thursday and it's going to be absolutely immense spongy frogs just said oh here we go lol like, oh the plug lol <laughs> look at them plugging their own stuff how very dare they spongy frog he makes me ruffle <laughs> anyway final clip final clip have you ever wanted a drone? Yes, every day I wake up thinking, get have. me a drone. Of course you do. You want a little drone, don't you? How much would you pay for a drone, Phil? $199. $199 plus, oh, pounds, plus obviously sales tax yeah. in the uncivilized nations. Um, well, there is a company in America who are building a surveillance drone that you can buy yourself. It's open source. It's going to cost $50. And we can see it right now. Have you ever wanted your own personal surveillance drone? Well, now you can check out the Mi Cam. Here we go. This is coming in 2014. As you can see, it fits in the palm of your hand. It That's costs... actually a massive hand, isn't it? That's, <laughs> it's a, that's a, a giant it's hand. It's just a huge hand that they painted, yeah. <laughs> Perfect. Well, that's just ruined the illusion, hasn't it? <laughs> there we go. No, it is. It's this I big. found you the smallest drone. <laughs> Anyway, this thing's going to cost $50, apparently. It's going to be sold open source, so you buy it like a, like a Raspberry Pi computer yeah, comes yeah. with a chip, and, uh, which is vaguely quad cot to shape, and you put it together. It's got a gigabyte of RAM, it's got Bluetooth, it's got Wi-Fi, better than my laptop. And, <laughs> and doesn't it, it flies behind you. Doesn't, yeah, it follows you around. It, it follows you around. It responds to voice commands, or apparently you'll be able to somehow tag yourself so that it will follow you around and live stream the back of your head, <laughs> thrilling as that will be. Yeah, but do you know what? This is this is it. This is what people are going to do with it. Here's my prediction. There'll be a real life first mm -hmm. person shooter game in which the camera flies behind someone's head and someone is guided through some maze. 
that's my interpretation of how this That's your interpretation. Work. I'll tell you what my interpretation of this is going to be. Stalking. Stalking, yeah. <laughs> it is the perfect tool for stalkers. Please don't use it for that. I'm not suggesting that you do use it to stalk people, but I'm somehow suggesting that Oh, well, I know for a fact that that's how it's going yeah. to end up. But then people will just get big giant drone swatters like a big butterfly net and just <laughs> take it down. Rubbish. Like those little fly swatters. Yeah. It'd <laughs> be pretty easy. Anyway, this stuff's amazing. It's got a full camera on it, it's got an SD card, it's got a USB, and it will follow you around yeah. as if that's not going to get irritating on the train <laughs> or in restaurants. <laughs> Yeah, I'm, kind of, I'm definitely getting one anyway when it comes I'm out. I'm definitely I'm getting gonna... one too. I whinge about it, but I really, really want one of those. Right. <laughs> anyway. So, is that the end of our show? Well, it would be, but I've got a bone to pick with you. With me? Yeah. Oh, no. Floridation. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> now, this is an argument that me and Phil were having earlier this week, and yeah. I want to duke it out on YouTube and see what YouTube Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Thinks. Let's tell you do it. Right. Floridation. Floridation is something that we've been doing since the 1950s, where we put fluoride, which is what's in toothpaste, in drinking water, and mm. governments do it. And the reason that they do it is because it's good for your teeth. Mm. And it's the number one thing stopping rotting teeth in parts of the US and the UK. The number one thing? Well, it's after toothpaste. After really. toothpaste, yeah. So the number two thing? The number two thing. Thank you. Oh, I failed in my quest. I failed my <laughs> argument. Phil wins. Anyway, the counter argument is that people say that it's some kind of conspiracy and that mm. it's going to hurt you. I disagree. I think it's brilliant, and I think it's the one thing that makes British teeth not quite as bad as they could be, yeah. <laughs> and saves us from the uh, saves us from the ire of our American cousins. <laughs> so, are you, am I supposed to disagree now? Yes, you are supposed to present your highly scientific arguments as to why fluoridation is terrible. Yeah. Okay. So, I don't have any of those. <laughs> Swing. <laughs> we'll see you again next week. <laughs> but I'll say this. They do put fluoride in toothpaste, and I rub toothpaste on my teeth, which, <laughs> which is where I want my fluoride to go. I don't know why it's they put it It's also the best place to rub toothpaste. I, you know, lots of things are good for me. Vitamin C is good for me, but they don't put vitamin C in the water. Vitamin D is good for me in the winter when we don't get any sun, but they don't put vitamin D in the water. I'm interested as to why they chose to put fluoride in the water to, to help my teeth when there's a whole host of things that they could put in there that would make me a healthy person, which they don't. It seems odd to me. So, I don't know what the science is, I'd be interested in looking at it, and I'm also interested to hear what everybody at home thinks. Tell us what you think. Should, should they put fluoride in you. the water? Yes, you. We're looking at you. And until you get back to us, we're just going to stand here in silence. I think we should totally end the show now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> See you next Friday.